Hey y'all! In today's video I wanted to show you how I would design .NET API using minimal APIs and vertical slice architecture. So first of all, what is vertical slice architecture? Let, let's operate on this uh, bookstore example I have here. So it's basically separating your project into modules where each module is fully self-contained and uh, is tied to particular business uh, aggregate. So for example, I have books here, uh, books module. Uh, this module will contain all the logic for the database, infrastructure, domain logic, application layer stuff and UI pages if I have the UI as well in this project uh, and each of those modules would uh, contain all the code it needs to survive it can be deployed separately or uh, together as a monolith, monolith and uh, we'll uh, show how that would look like as well and this is a contrast to the onion based uh, layer ar architecture that uh, you may have already seen in some projects and uh, it used to be very popular uh, so this is uh, the way of splitting your code, not by business, business but by uh, the, the intent of the code. So, for example, the, the database layer uh, will handle all of the publisher, books, authors, clients and all the other needs for database and nothing else. Uh, the same goes for domain, application and UI. And why is it uh, worse than the vertical slice architecture? Well. For example, if you're working on some feature for books, maybe you're adding an additional field like a release date, uh, you'll need to add the UI for it, yeah? So in the grid and in the model for editing this uh, uh, date, uh, you'll need to add it, but then you'll also need to change the DTO object that uh, interacts with the UI. So you'll need to go to this layer as well. Maybe some domain layers, uh, domain layer stuff already uh, will change with it because uh, you'll need to process it differently and stuff like that. And then you'll also need to add the column in the database for it as well. So you'll need to dig down through all of these layers, which is hard to navigate and some of pieces of logic may be lost because it's not all together. You'll need to jump through all of them. And that's why I think that navigation through such projects is much, much harder. And that's why I uh, prefer the vertical slice architecture. As I've said, uh, it can be deployed as a monolith, uh, so it all lives under uh, one app service, for example, and uh, it just uh, adds all the modules as needed. So as you can see, you can split the application into uh, microservices as well. If you ever need to do that, uh, it's pretty easy with the vertical slice arch architecture, much easier than with the onion based layer. So, uh, so maybe let's navigate to code and let's see how it looks like. So as you can see, I have my Swagger page here. Uh, for the tutorial I've built, uh, I've implemented one of the modules, the users module, uh, where you can get user by name, you can create users, uh, you can delete users once you're logged in, and you can also log in with your email and password. And let's see how it looks like in code. So I have a pretty standard program CS where I have my Swagger database and all of the stuff needed for authentication and authorization. But let's navigate to my modules folder where uh, our actual code lives. So as you could see in the example, the users folder uh, should contain some logic for user modules. And as you can see, the heart of it is the static class of users module. And it exposes two methods. First one is the add users module. So it uh, is uh, responsible for registering all of the dependencies it needed for the users module. So as you can see, I registered here all of my handlers. So the four handlers that we saw for the four endpoints uh, in the swagger and also some additional dependencies needed for some other uh, purposes. So I have the password generation service uh, for the encryption of passwords and the JWT token generation service as well. So I can expose uh, JWT tokens for my users uh, so they can reuse them on later requests. And uh, the other method is the map user endpoints and this is the minimal API portion of the video. So I just expose the I endpoint road builder static method to map the user's endpoints. So we just uh, take our endpoints and add additional endpoints to it. The first one is the get method. So we just uh, have the delegate handler uh, that uh, checks if the name is even in the query. If it's not, just return the bad request. But if it is present, uh, we handle it with our handler that we'll navigate to uh, later on and to return the OK or not found based on the uh, criteria that we have in our database. As you can see, I uh, also decorated all of my endpoints with some metadata uh, using the Swagger um, extension methods. So I have the with name, 
uh, which just allows me to name my endpoints. Uh, I specify if authorization should be performed on each endpoint. I specify what is the produced outcome of each endpoint as well, and also the endpoints uh, other uh, result types that it can return. So in this scenario, I can return the bad request and not found uh, exceptions as well. And I also tagged all of my endpoints as you can see in this example. So uh, let's see our commands folder where uh, we have the handlers and the DTO objects for all of our uh, put, post and delete uh, endpoints. So first one is the create handler. We inject the database context straight into the handler and the user password service as well. Uh, we create the user, we hash the password and save it to the database. Uh, the next folder, uh, the next file is the DTO object. So we just uh, have our name, email, and password that uh, the client can type in, and we accept it. Uh, the same story, or even easier story, is for the delete handler, where we just uh, uh, check the current user if it's authenticated. We can just delete the user that we have. And the login handler is a little bit more complex because we need to also uh, return to the user the token that he. He, want, uh, he needs to, to perform other authenticated requests. So we just uh, check if the user exists and if the password matches. If it does, we generate, we generate the token for him. And the next uh, folder is the entities folder. So all of our users uh, entities uh, needed uh, are here. For now, it's just the user class, uh, which derives from the identity user and is extended with one more property of name. So we can decorate our users with name and uh, we also have the entity configuration for it. So we just name our table here and add the key to ID. Uh, so pretty basic stuff here. And, uh, we have all of our JWT uh, service related stuff uh, in its own folder. So we have the way to register the account authentication with JWT. Uh, so this code is just copied from somewhere uh, where we have the JWT token set up. Uh, we also have the options for it, which are filled in with app settings and the actual generation service. So uh, we can return the token for the authenticated user once he logs in. Uh, we also have the passwords folder where all of the password logic lives. So we have the uh, hashing uh, service so we can create and verify if the hash matches uh, using bcrypt and save it to the database, not in plain text. So uh, it's much, much more safe this way. Uh, we also have our queries, queries folder and uh, we have the handler to get by name. Uh, we check if the user exists in the database, if it's not return null and uh, return 404 based on this in the actual endpoint logic. And if, it's in, if he exists, just return the DTO and uh, the DTO lives here as well. So as you can see, if we want to maybe change something in the query, uh, we need to navigate to the folder. We have the DTO here, the handler here. So everything lives in the same place. If we also need to modify something in database, it's right beside it in the entities folder as well. Uh, we can even go a step further and uh, maybe even cut this part out into the queries folder. So add an additional uh, static method here, add queries, submodule, and just uh, register all of our endpoints there. So that would be much, much, much uh, easier and it's much more granular. And if we ever want to deploy the application, not as the uh, whole monolith app, but rather as the microservices, we can do that just by uh, uh, cutting out the module into a new solution and deploying it from there. Uh, it will be pretty easy. The program CS uh, should uh, just be the same. Uh, we just copy all of our uh, module related stuff uh, into the new folder and uh, it should all work. So what uh, what happens when we want to extend this uh, example by, for example, adding the books module. So we just uh, add the static class of book modules. You add your two uh, methods. So the add, use, uh, add books module and uh, map books endpoints. And uh, just kind of go from there. You add your entities as needed. You add your uh, domain logic as needed and anything else that you might need, maybe some uh, other service connection, uh, it can all live under the books folder and be fully self-contained and ready to be cut out into a separate for, uh, solution if ever needed. Uh, yes, so that would be highly scalable uh, and uh, 
it is much easier to navigate because you're not creating those uh, uh, divides in your code based on some, some kind of intent that is not domain driven. Yeah, and so with that, I thank you for watching. I hope this was educational enough and I hope you learned something new. Uh, if you want to see more videos, please subscribe, please like the video and let me know what I can improve in my future videos. So thank you for watching.